Oops. What's happening? Okay. Why? Why is it going like this? Oh, I see you, but I let me try again. Okay, can you see it? Can you see the slide? Okay, let's try to put it on presentation mode. Okay, here we are. Okay, thank you all of you for being here. Thank for the invitation to Eduardo and uh, congratulations for the excellent meeting so far. I will be uh, going to uh, show you the experience we had uh, being uh, living in my institution. Uh, the situation in Italy regarding ICF is quite uh, similar to other countries. ICF is mentioned in the legislation is about school inclusion, rehabilitation. There are regional implementation uh, ICF based tool in disability assessment evaluation, for example, in the Veneto region. And uh, the ICF also in the very recently re, uh, republished uh, guidelines for rehabilitation is uh, present every every page. But from this plethora uh, um, of uh, mentioning to the actual use, there is a long way. Uh, so disability has been assessed with ICF in several branches, in several fields. And here I'm showing you all the areas where these experience have been taking place. But what I'm concentrating today is uh, the rehabilitation in hospital experience. Our institution is a private nonprofit uh, institution, which is part of a national health system. It is uh, uh, recognized for uh, childhood and adult, young adults neuro rehabilitation, and is located in the Veneto region in Northeast Italy. The characteristic of the work is a multi-professional team uh, work with physician nurses, rehabilitation technicians, educators, pedagogists, and social workers, all together, all meeting and meeting together. For you who don't know very well geography, that's Italy, that's the Veneto region, and there we are always showing Conegliano. And here is my place. Some of you who have been to Conegliano might recognize the odd shape of the center, which is like a, a wheel with a, with a, uh, with a um, uh, how do you call it, uh, prolongation that goes to, a, to, the, to, a, to a tire. The characteristic of a rehabilitation project, which are mandated and mandatory in, in Italy, is the fact that you have to have an evaluation, a functional diagnosis, and then the building of a project, which is articulated in programs. We in, initially used IC, ICF-CY merging. It was decided to be completed in ICF. That process is uh, formally and officially completed, although with some problems, and we might have to go back to that to improve the system, to improve the, uh, the result of this uh, process, which was certainly positive in terms of having only one ICF recognized for everybody of all the ages. I think I finished here. I don't know if the time is okay. I pass over to Eduardo if he's back with uh, his computer. No, oh, the time is okay. Very well, very well. Thank you for our presentation. We will leave the questions for the final. We have three presentations now. And if Andres Souza Rocha is ready, he can share his screen and continue our block. Um, Andrea, thank you very much. I would like to have you on board during the questions after 20 or 30 minutes. Okay. Andre, are you there? Hello, I am here. Yeah. I'm hearing you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for 
inviting me to this outstanding event with renowned researchers with brilliant speeches so far. And I will just share my screen with you guys. So just a minute. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Let me know if you are watching the correct screen. Everyone can watch. Yeah. Is it sharing right now? It's fine. Okay. Thank you. So as Eduardo just introduced me, my name is Andrea and I am a physical therapist. I work uh, at this uh, special education foundation in the state of Santa Catarina, Brazil, the south of Brazil. And uh, we team worked to work in, uh, to work through this uh, concept of this perspective, I should say, of, uh, how to to apply the ICF in the context of giftedness. So I partnered with a, a, a two with two colleagues of mine, uh, Ananda Burin, who is a, a professor of mathematics, and Aline Mendes, who is a psychologist, and we discussed how uh, the how we have evolved to the concept of functioning and how we can actually try to get get going with this concept within the the context of giftedness so we will talk a, a little bit about our proposal to enlarge the ICF application towards this public so uh, I will mainly discuss the education perspective of ICF using and how it has evolved and the, the functioning, how is conceptualizing the giftedness of children and youth. Uh, the positive aspects of functioning, which is something that is predicted in the ICF and, and not, has not been addressed in a broad audience so far proposing a, a, a expansion, expanded qualification and from the environmental factors as we already know, and uh, the future implications uh, through the educational using, usage of the ICF model and how we can debate on that, on those possibilities. So uh, since it's uh, first publication in 2001 and then its translation into Portuguese back in 2003, we have reached 20 years of ICF development and uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, reports and papers and, and books uh, about the, the application of our classification through the different systems in health, including health, the social and educational system. And uh, some countries have uh, going forward with the uh, uh, with some political uh, actions towards the uh, use use the application of ICF through the, the those educational systems, such as uh, we have examples in Brazil with the uh, our uh, inclusive the Brazilian law of inclusion and the educational system in Portugal as well, uh, Switzerland, Japan, Taiwan. Turkey and Italy, as the previous uh, uh, presenter had pointed out, he has just pointed out. So just to name a few, we have other examples, of course, but uh, we have seen a lot of uh, improvement in the use of ICF uh, in the context of the educational application, either for special education or early intervention programs. So with this, this uh, with this knowledge about the, the how functioning is conceptualized uh, within the context of ICF, the educators have uh, come about new perspectives of the ICF 
using and how to apply in the context of special needs and, and educational special needs. And some educators have uh, commented on the lack of uh, uh, approach and they don't see how the ICF could actually encompass the, the issue of giftedness. So how we can measure the levels of functioning who are uh, considered above the standard for the general uh, public, for the children and youth who are, you know, uh, showing a higher talent towards some areas. So how do we measure this? How do we classify this within the ICF contest? So uh, we discussed a proposal in which we can expand the qualifier so as to deal with this contest of giftedness and recognize how uh, a higher functioning can also be uh, perhaps uh, qualified through the ICF lens. So uh, the concept of giftedness has evolved through the, the, the last decades and we have now uh, reached to a point in which uh, the concept of giftedness based on the, the proposal by Joseph Renzulli uh, has been assumed as a more uh, recognized uh, theoretical framework to deal with uh, giftedness going beyond the, the intellectual level and considering the creativity and task commitment and other areas in which uh, children and youth can thrive and show some high skills compared to their peers. So and the concept bring uh, the concept brings about uh, some uh, enlarged uh, enlarged uh, definition in which uh, leadership, psychomotor skills and arts uh, combined with great creativity, learning engagement and task performance skills may play a major role in when it comes to identify uh, high talented kids and, and giftedness. So if we expand from the academic level to other areas, we will have uh, to consider that we have evolved and considered that other areas of functioning may also uh, dictate or stress a high functioning. So we go from, I, I brought some examples here to illustrate this and we have uh, started from this intellectual level with the mathematics playing a major role in identify those, those kids such as in this movie. So this was the, the, as we consider the giftedness as a intellectual higher potential, but now we have also the psychomotor skills. Our, our uh, gold, our medal winner, silver medal winner in the last Olympic games of, from uh, skating. And she is, she started in the really earlier age and also the girl from, from Korea who started to master the violin at the age of three and a half years. So with this in mind, we estimate that nowadays uh, 3.5 to 5% of the world population may score higher uh, on IQ tests, but this consider only uh, one area of giftedness, such as the academic area. If we uh, assume the expanded concept of giftedness, we uh, estimate we can estimate uh, a increasing, uh, reaching up to 15 to 30 percent of the world population. So all those kids are not uh, currently uh, classified through the, the ICF because we can actually uh, stress how higher functioning can be qualified through the codes uh, that we have available so far. 
So how does the ICF apply? How can we uh, enlarge the qualifiers system to include those kids? So nowadays we have the, the general qualifier structure and, and the, if we consider the components of functioning and disability, we can only indicate the preservation or loss of a given health construct. So it's a neutral or negative. Gifted children and youth uh, show uh, abilities that are um, markedly above the description the qualifiers are able to identify. So the point no point O, no problem, is not enough to uh, stress how those kids can go uh, beyond the standard. So a negative scale doesn't predict the above average functioning, so as to say. So how can we uh, get started with this new, uh, perhaps new concept? So if we consider the, this, those areas that we mentioned before, the main chapters uh, that we could take as a starting point would be the mental functions and learning and applying knowledge. And as I stated before, the qualification the, the qualifiers can only assume a negative scale for those two uh, components, but we already have a, a way to classify positive aspects, uh, likewise the environmental factors. So through the environmental factors, we can classify a positive aspect with a plus sign and a barrier with the standard dot sign, a negative scale. So if we just uh, change uh, the labels and uh, consider a positive aspect, we can uh, expand the qualification system to a, towards a positive uh, approach. So the ICF uh, states in its Annex 2 that at the user's discretion, coding in scales can be developed to capture the positive aspects of functioning. So we proposed a slightly different way in which we can uh, actually point out the high functioning or capacity through those two chapters of function, the body functions and activity and participation. So it's, it's the sim similar system from the facilitators. We have the plus sign, but the labels would be adapted so as to uh, include a high functioning and capacity. So plus O, no problem, no or limitation in function, or in function or capacity. A plus one is slightly high function or capacity. A plus two, moderately high function or capacity. A plus three, considerably high function or capacity. And a plus four, completely high function or capacity. Consider also the quantitative approach with the percentages for uh, when we link uh, some outcome measures, a standardized measure, and also the plus eight high function capacity not specified when we don't have a, a measure, but we can see that uh, there is a difference. So uh, this, this expanding model would uh, permit the description of the high capacity, creativity, and leadership in one or more areas of this individual's function. So we, uh, we have some examples in which we can uh, illustrate the use of this uh, new approach of qualifications towards the giftedness. So if you take the, the classical example of uh, learning to calculate and the, the mathematics that is also uh, you know, described uh, a a sign of intelligence in, in the educational perspective. So if we consider a child who is able to learn to calculate or calculate in a significantly less time compared to their peers. So if you apply a test and most of the children uh, has performed these activities in 60 minutes and a particular kid has done it in 10 minutes. So six times uh, in, in the faster than the other kids. So less than half of the time taken by the, uh, his or her peers. So actually, currently this, this particular child would get uh, a point O and no limitations for those, those two codes. However, this child uh, 
has uh, indeed an above average ability to perform this exercise. So uh, a positive coding alternative would uh, stand, would be more uh, coherent with this, this kid capacity. So a plus four or for the learn to calculate or calculate would show a capacity up to 100% above the average for these activities according to the quantitative option of qualifier. So nowadays, uh, currently this kid would also, would, could only be described as with presenting with no limitation at all. But uh, while she or he has a higher capacity for this intellectual uh, function, and those uh, body functions chapters could also be uh, classified somehow and qualified. The information could also be qualified even in the absence of a standardized test by just uh, pointing out a plus eight for a high function not specified. So this is an alternative that may be uh, adopted when it comes to uh, identify this high ability in a, a kid in a classroom or in a different context. So with all it, uh, we, we have to balance between the positive code and a new, neutral and negative coding. So we, what we have nowadays is something that can, uh, it's not able to measure how high the functioning of those kids can reach. So if we have a high motor skills as a example, of a gifted talent, uh, a kid who, uh, or, or children with uh, those motor skills and, and higher uh, talent to execute movements. And we classify their psychomotor functions or acquiring skills uh, activities. <clears throat> we actually have the same problem. Uh, we will only be able to uh, stress the lack of problem or no limitation. Uh, whereas with a positive coding alternative, we can, uh, we can describe, is, uh, describe the function, the psychomotor function with a higher function plus eight or the, the, the activity involved in acquiring skills as a completely high capacity. capacity uh, when we apply a standardized test such as MABC2 or TGMD2, some gross motor function tests that can measure the, those uh, psychomotor uh, skills. So <clears throat> this would uh, allow us to give a, a deeper view through this, those kids functioning, the, mainly in the motor aspects. When we consider, for example, the, the perspective of a kid uh, join a, a sport or be selected to, with a higher talent for a particular uh, team uh, player or you know some uh, level of as a gymnastic or a ballet dancer and so on and so forth. Creativity in, later, in leadership, mental functions uh, of sequencing complex movements. And take this as, a, as the example of the, the little girl uh, playing the violin. So there are a number of uh, examples of kids uh, who are accepted through those uh, musical schools. Uh, Juilliard is considered uh, well known as a, a outstanding music school art school and so on. So nowadays uh, for Bolshoi Ballet and other uh, high demanded art schools, they are they have a, sele a selection process. And so kids who are uh, mark who have who, who come to those selection process and, and thrive and are approved, they of course show uh, some high talented for those uh, psychomotor or uh, creativity uh, skills. And nowadays we can apply the ICF as it is because we don't have a possibility to use a positive uh, qualifier uh, process.
and the leadership as well. We have some examples of making decisions, handling stress. So kids who can uh, show uh, a, a better uh, capacity towards those uh, activities would only receive a 0, .0 uh, qualifier, whereas they actually have a better way to deal with that. And we also have the, the issue of twice exceptionality. So the definition of uh, twice, those twice exceptional kids are kids who are, uh, who, who have a health condition, is what as a disability or disorder, such as a physical or sensory disability or uh, autism spectrum disorder or attention deficit and, hyperactivity disorder and and along with some high skill to perform a task or dealing with a, some a learning process in a far better way than their peers. So if we consider today the, how the ICF and uh, this morning uh, we have some experiences through the, the usage of uh, the ICF in the context of autism spectrum disorder, we can see that we are really focused on uh, identify the, the loss and how the, the negative aspects are stressed. But we also have some kids who may actually have restrictions in basic interpersonal, interpersonal interactions. It's expected. But we also have some of those uh, uh, wonderful children who are able to focus a great deal of attention to some area of interest. The hyper-focus is something that it's really remarkable in the autism spectrum disorder. And if we take a kid who can uh, execute some math, some math exercise in a far superior way, uh, you know, they can concentrate attention and calculate and can solve the problem <clears throat> better than their peers. It won't be uh, indicated through the checklist or car sets that we have so far because the qualifiers can uh, point at all this. So with the positive qualifier, those kids would, of course, uh, we would identify the functioning, the lack of uh, activity limitation or participation restrictions, environmental factors that can act as barriers or facilitators. But with the positive aspect for, for functioning and activity and participation, we would also be able to identify those uh, positive aspects of autism that some, sometimes are not uh, stressed uh, enough to the families or their educators and health professionals who are dealing with those kids. So uh, for future implications, this public of uh, gifted people has uh, received uh, some attention uh, and the ICF uh, expanding its use with the proposal that we have uh, discussed here um, gives us the opportunity to apply the ICF as a screening or follow-up tool and as a, a, a tool for further evaluation, early uh, identification of the high functioning of those kids, uh, help to uh, when it comes to referrals to other programs and help us to improve uh, the education and health systems to deal with those kids and help those kids <clears throat> to reach the, uh, and have the, the more positive impact on the society and in their lives as well, because uh, as a lot of research has pointed out, they can contribute uh, by playing those outstanding roles as scholars, researchers, high performance athletes, recognized artists and entrepreneurial and social leaders. So identifying this uh, very from a very early on point, point starting point would help them and their families to deal with these conditions throughout their lives. So as we know that uh, the classification is under constant improvement, uh, with this proposal, we aim to contribute to this process, bringing the light 
bringing to light the debate on high functioning. So this greater coverage, including gifted people, would uh, perhaps encourage the ICF use in the educational scenario and uh, add other possibilities, mainly in the field of special education. That uh, that's where some of those uh, challenges will come about as we improve the use of ICF through this field. I would like to invite you to learn more about this through this uh, editorial paper we published in the last uh, issue of the ICF Brazil Scientific Journal. And we bring the details of this approach that we propose here. And I also would like to thank you for having me through this uh, amazing event. I am available for all uh, questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Okay, Andre, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Now I know that I don't know anything. Very, <laughs> very good. Uh, Cassia is the next one. I ask everybody to note the questions because after Cassia, we have a little discussion on all of the points. Uh, Andrea, if you can share your article in the chat, please do that. Okay, the link. Thank you. Casa, I will share my screen. Your presentation is with me. So give me one moment. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> <clears throat> well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Casa Bushala. Uh, for a long time, I worked at the Brazilian Center for the Family of International Classification in Portuguese. And now I am uh, a professor at the University of Sao Paulo. First, I would like to thank Eduardo for organizing this event, this symposium, and also to help me because my computer doesn't agree to, be, to, do, to do this. So I have to the help. Uh, Eduardo is helping. Eduardo is helping me. Well, I hope this view as important and well succeed, succeeded as was the previous one. And I thank you, Eduardo, to organizing this. In this talk, I intend to raise some points regarding the implementation of the ICF in Brazil, trying to make a provision. Next, please. During these 20 years, we have been involved in disseminating the ICF in the country. Many training courses, talks in Congress, ICF marketing, resulting in the ICF adoption for some very important institutions as the Social Security National Institute, the Association for the Assistance of Disabled Children, this is a free translation, AACD, and others. We also reported the experience on teaching and researching on ICF in Brazil. Next, next one, please. Uh, I believe we did a lot in only 20 years. Assuming all the difficulties to introduce something new and complex. Unfortunately, in spite of all efforts, we have nothing on ICF in health statistics and in administration, and also for the I think other uses of the classification. Please, Eduardo, the next one. You can cl click another another time. Yes, thank you. Um, regarding the future and to preview the future here is something very, very difficult. Some time ago, we had a minister of economics who said that in Brazil, even the past is unpredictable. I believe INSS 
probably will continue to evaluate the disability in order to give the benefits. And also to evaluate people with disability who want to retire. We faced some difficulty in translating the term disability into Portuguese. Even today, there is some disagreement with the Portuguese term for uh, with the, this term. The manual the government produced in 2019 points that disability was wrongly translated to Portuguese in the ICF. We must agree adopt the same language to proceed. Unfortunately, I do not see a consensus and the government will continue to use different translations to disability-related terms, make comparison difficult. The next one, please. You can click, yeah, thank you. I believe that many institutions, no, the previous one, please. I believe that many institutions or organizations will continue to use the classification and that they will improve its use. AACD has been doing a fantastic job on this issue. It was a long process for that to happen, require, requiring a day-to-day -day convincing, convincing work. Uh, to increase the adoption of the ICF in clinical practice, besides the divulgation of the good, the good results, I believe there has to be more incentives, such as related to reimbursement by health plans or other, other kind of financial stimulus. I believe that the inclusion of the ICF in the electronic medical record in the adoption of the ICD-11 with the chapter of function may help to keep ICF in clinical practice. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, you can click another time. I believe, I believe these two items must be considered together, education and research. So far, a first, a first step has been taken, and we have professionals at universities working with ICF, doing research and publishing. I mentioned they work in last year's presentation. The next step are to show results to publish. This does not depend only on researches here in Brazil since all experience are valid. Next one, please, Eduardo. Thus, I would like to mark this talk, this speech, with the importance of having people committed to the dissemination of the ICF. People acting in courses and training, offering guidance and support activities to users. We need to have that kind of commitment and engagement to continue spreading the use of the ICF. Next to us. Unfortunately, we do not have a commitment from the government to make ICF a useful tool for the health sector. We can click another time Please. Although there is a resolution from 2012 that the ICF should be used in a health system, nothing was done to make it real. Eduardo, you can click, please. One more. Including uh, regarding the preparation of an instrument for each use, as was mentioned in the inclusion law from 2015. Next one. Next slide. I believe that because you have this very special group of people interested 
in the ICF, and it is good, who produces works like this that was presented as poster last in the, the last uh, Ufix meeting this week, we will continue to disseminate the ways in which the classification is used. Next to us. However, it is getting harder and harder to do science in Brazil. We need to have people really involved with this proposal who can fight on a daily basis to achieve some success. Some success. I do not see anyone other than the people in this group. The people mentioned in this presentation with the ICF skills and knowledge to carry out activities related to this classification in Brazil. Next one, please. To justify my position, we have a country with more than 600,000 deaths from COVID-19, which occurred because the person in charge of the president believed in her immunity denied to buy vaccines and distribute drugs that do not work for disease. A government that decreased in 87% of the budget for science and technology. A government led by some, someone who does not wear a mask in public, in public and who takes the mask off a child face. And this other fault is a former health minister who was caught wearing the mask like this. I think, and this is my personal opinion, we will only have a decent country again when you change this government. Next to one, Eduardo, please. In short, I believe we can continue to promote the ICF <coughs> to make it better, to make it better known and used as long as we have competent and people working. This involvement is linked to positive results, access to classification and its concept, the correct, not the erroneous one. It is important to have an official commitment ensuring usage, usage support. Finally, in order to continue to have ICF implemented in this country, I see no solution other than to make this group officially responsible for the ICF in Brazil. This is what I intend to, to say for now, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo, thank you all. Very, very good. Casa, thank you for your presentation. Now we can open to questions. I'd like to start. I have a question to Andrea. Uh, I have heard something about Italy using ICF in social policies. And you mentioned it during your presentation that you are far from a clinical use in nationally in uh, statistical use as well. Uh, I'd like you to comment in details what you think and how do you feel with this information and this status in your country, please. Thank you, Eduardo. Well, the problem starts from the people. Well. Uh, paradoxically, so since uh, even though uh, ICF is a product of the World Health uh, Organization, still is well received by educators, teachers, professors, in school, by social uh, workers, is much less uh, well received in the medical world because uh, uh, the medical world has already a lot of uh, technical private languages, but uh, each of them uh, are reluctant to, uh, to drop in favor of a more 
universal, but definitely less specific, less uh, uh, um, tailored uh, language. So I see this as a first problem. The other thing is that nothing is moving if money is not there. So if you don't make mandatory, for example, in the rehabilitation area, to attach to the uh, ICD code an ICF functioning profile as the, 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 more, the most uh, uh, minimal that you can think, but a, a functioning profile anyway, to justify the type of intervention you do, then you are left with the goodwill of each uh, professional. Now, in our, in our case, we uh, had the advantage of uh, the driving force from within because the physiotherapist uh, grasped the power of ICF in making uh, uh, clear and evident the, um, the target of their uh, activity, target of their intervention. And also they were able for the first time to connect very well with all the other professionals. They in some way carried over all the others. And that's why in my institution, at least the system now is working. For example, psychologists, who had uh, bound, who were bound to very precise, defined, uh, professional specific language, were the most reluctant. And medics were the most reluctant. Obviously, because again, we are used to have uh, our own uh, jargon and to drop it in favor of a, a simple uh, and uh, universal language is, is always uh, felt as a loss. Again, I think the first step would be to make mandatory to attach a functioning profile if you do a functioning intervention on that person. And the introduction of a functioning intervention classification might help in this case. We are in this desperate need for a functioning intervention classification that is broad enough and precise enough to code also those functioning interventions that are now missed most of the time from the records. Second, you have to identify driving people. And that's another key element. Of course, that might change from place to place. In my institution, we are the physiotherapist. In another place, could be our, our professional. But I think those are the two ingredients that are needed. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, I think so. I think there are some similar problems in other countries. And then, do you think WHO can do something else or something different? to help them or uh, you, you think the network is enough? No, the point is uh, WHO is offering products mm -hmm. and the member states are free to accept and use those products or not. Now, if you want to be in a community of states, you should talk the same language. And this is happening already with the ICD. For mortality and morbidity report, everybody is reporting the same thing in the same language, even though with some nuances, because not, not all the data are, are precise. We need to step to the next level with ICF as well, because functioning information in the day, world of today, where chronic disability, chronic illness is the problem, not the acute illness, not the uh, thing that kills you, but things that makes your functioning worse for the rest of your life. That is more important. And the intervention of both are, are the most important. So it is to, uh, has to be a joint uh, service that we do not only to WHO by itself, but to our, our fellow citizens to push in our states for introducing steps that are not only declamatories, you know, just stating that ICF has to be the basis. But then you do not have any enactment any, any legislation compelling you to do so. It's pretty much as what uh, Cassia was uh, referring in Brazil. You have something that you have on in the law that tells you that you have to use ICF, but then you don't have any executive uh, order that push you to, to do and how to do it. Because that's the, 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 you know, the screen uh, behind which everybody's hiding. Since use appears to be difficult, then cannot be done. This is not true. Another thing could be the, the availability within ICD-11 of a functioning rubric. I've been very critical about that because that's, I felt, was a betrayal of ICF in terms of complexity of functioning. So conceding to 
to a simplified vision of functioning within a CD11 as a, as a way to describe functioning. But still, I think since ICD is, is mandatorily used by everybody working health, the fact that they have a window finally in, fi in functioning, and uh, I, we ask to WH to make the link to ICF uh, specific code more explicit, could be indeed the way to, to, to introduce a functioning um, evaluation within the ICD work. Okay. Para os falantes de português, resumidamente, basicamente, ele disse que o governo precisa é, tornar mandatório, né, é, obrigatório, o uso das duas classificações para que se efetive a, a aplicação. Então, so the table is open. Everybody can ask questions for Andrea. I may Andrea. ask a question to Andrea? Yes, of course. First, first of all, very nice presentation, and you had a very crazy presentation. Very, very, very nice idea because that's true. We miss the evaluation of a, a above the average. We always say uh, ICF is neutral, uh, highlights the positive functioning, but we stop ourselves to the zero. So indeed, I think that's a good idea. But I, I suggest you two steps. First of all, remember that uh, ICF is a WHO project. And ICF is a, was attached to a health condition. So it is true that you can assess it to uh, sort out triage people are going to uh, gift uh, school, but the real world of application could be indeed the SD, for example, the Asperger syndrome, what was in that time uh, known as Asperger, that uh, might be identified within the uh, realm of a more complex disability. The emergency of a island of a very high, exceptionally high function. So that's when you frame your proposal. That's my second uh, advice. Uh, with a new uh, platform going to be uh, operational next year, everybody has the ability to uh, feel, file a proposal for ICF update and revision. And I think this is a very sound and uh, useful proposal. Provided that you again frame it in a word of health. André, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. André, se você puder, é, se, se você puder, você é, só resume a pergunta dele e, e a sua resposta também ao, ao final, tá bom? Obrigado. Sim, sim. O, uh, o professor André colocou, André né, Martinuzzi. É, colocou a questão de, da CIF ter sido proposta pela Organização Mundial da Saúde, então tem esse aspecto da condição de saúde, né, e que essa proposta realmente soa é, útil, principalmente na questão ali da dupla excepcionalidade que foi colocada, e que é, realmente é baseado nesse processo neutro, né, e que realmente teria uma alta funcionalidade também que poderia ser proposto no futuro, mas que também tem esse aspecto educacional que, pelo que eu entendi, corrija se eu estiver errado, ele também não é totalmente é, abordado pela OMS por ter é, esse esse processo da alta habilidade indo além, né, do processo de saúde. Me corrija se eu estiver errado na tradução, mas acredito que foi isso. Uhum. É, então. Então, In eu, vou, eu vou responder aqui ao professor. Uh, thank you, professor Andrea Machinuzzi. Am I pronouncing it correctly? <laughs> As, uh, it's an interesting question because when we work with the, uh, special education, we have this interchange, uh, interconnected areas, and it's quite challenging because we have those uh, educators uh, working with both uh, sides uh, you know, and when you go to inclusive education, not all the aspects of this public are uh, legally accepted through the different countries. So the giftedness may have some uh, other approach through the educational system. And in other countries, it is considered within the uh, context of a special education which means some kids may be regarded as a category within this, uh, this area. So with that in mind, uh, we 
uh, was uh, we were actually discussing how functioning may be approached through those kids, mainly because we started with those uh, twice exceptionality uh, issues. So kids with uh, a health condition such as uh, ADHD or ASD or other uh, physical disability and cerebral palsy and so on and so forth. And they also uh, come with uh, high skills in other areas. And so this started to uh, uh, bring uh, our attention to how uh, we can uh, identify the functioning that goes beyond what we have as a standard point. And this was a first study that we took and, and we have seen some challenges for uh, some, I, I had a conversation with a physical educator who asses kids in schools and we have also the talent for uh, sports. The sports field is something that uh, is uh, it's something that kids may have some talent for some area, or uh, we have some studies on the ballet dancers for the Bolshoi Ballet uh, session that we have here. And so it started to to you know uh, provoke me in a way in which how can we uh, discuss with other people who are uh, far more you know, uh, aware of the ICF development, a way in which perhaps we can expand the positive uh, approach from the facilitators for the environmental factors through to this other chapter. So this was a first, so we basically took something that uh, already exists and expand to those other areas and give a contest. That was what I was trying to, to show here. So we have some uh, indicators through the ICF. If you see the chapter, the, the introdu introduction, the annex, annex two. So th it's possible with positive perspective and functioning. And so maybe it's not that hard. We can actually just make, uh, a bring about the debate on it, it is useful or not. And I really, I found it brilliant your comment that people are always uh, putting barriers in the ICF use itself, you know, as something hard. And in the ICD is a far more, uh, it would be easier to use the ICD. But it, when it comes to resources, as you pointed out, so how do you manage the resources when you have just ASD, but it's a spectrum. So different kids with autism have different needs, different functional levels, different uh, team of professionals interacting with them and their families come from different contexts. So it won't be enough for those, those uh, cerebral palsy or autism spectrum disorder and other uh, health conditions if we don't go for uh, further through this functioning model we will have uh, uh, loads of money wasted on some areas that doesn't require that investment and other kids lacking the right investment and teams and so on and so forth so that that's mm -hmm. the main the main purpose of this speech okay, thank yeah. you for the the question. If you can summary in, in Portuguese language, please. Eu contextualizei aqui para o professor a questão né, da, da, de como surgiu essa possibilidade de uma codificação positiva, além dos fatores ambientais, principalmente na questão da dupla excepcionalidade, que é um uma situação onde a criança tem um diagnóstico de TEA, né, de autismo ou de TDAH, ou mesmo paralisia cerebral, e ela tem uma alta habilidade em alguma área. né? É, e como que a CIF poderia ser aplicada nesse contexto, já que ela não prevê uma, uma qualificação da informação acima do zero, vamos dizer assim, para essas áreas, né? E a, como isso surge na questão 
da, da educação especial e da educação inclusiva, né? E vão surgindo esses aspectos conforme a CIF vai sendo usado. Uhum. E aí eu só finalizei com, é, colocando para ele que a fala dele foi muito bem colocada, foi brilhante, no sentido das pessoas ainda acharem que é o caminho da, de, de uso da CIF é mais difícil que o do CID, mas se você pensar nos recursos, você vai alocar recursos baseados no diagnóstico, você vai deixar de é, investir corretamente em quem mais precisa. né? Uhum. Se você tem o TEA como exemplo, você vai ter um espectro, então você vai ter crianças que vão necessitar muito mais de uma abordagem de saúde do que outras. Se você uhum. investir igual, vai sobrar recurso para um e faltar para outro. Ok, André, we have any new questions? If not, we have uh, Janice Miller. May, may, I, may I ask a little bit or comments? Yes, uh, sorry, uh, a little bit because Janice Miller, Janice Miller, how do ah. I say? Uh, and when Janice? Thank you. Uh, yes, okay. yes. Thank you, Eduardo. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you, Andre, for that very interesting presentation. And it's just a comment is to say, um, and some of you online, maybe Andre and others may remember or recall this in the development of ICF many years ago, that our, uh, our late colleague, Dr. David Gray from Washington University, um, had proposed in the development phases that we consider this very topic um, and he came from a physical disability perspective, but um, he did raise this issue in the context of health conditions for those who were functioning at, uh, for example, elite athletes uh, and in other areas of function. Now, this was introduced at a time when the qualifiers were being identified and debated and did not um, eventually make it through to, to that stage. Um, but there may be colleagues at Washington University that David worked with. Uh, that group may still be involved with uh, those aspects. So that might be one, one uh, other contact for you. Uh, the second thing as Andre, uh, Andreas mentioned for your proposal is to uh, uh, another sort of key factor for success would be that the proposal be across the, the age spectrum, not just for children, but also uh, perspectives for adults, but also across the uh, domains of mental health and physical health. Uh, so um, thank you very much. Uh, those are just my comments. And I had one, one question, could I, um, Eduardo, for Andrea? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question in the chat, I'm not sure. Andrea, if um, you want to comment on this, I saw your response, but my question uh, was regarding your rehab uh, data collection system and whether or not um, you have a, a rehab specific grouping methodology in the future coming up, or if you have it currently, where you actually use, have a method for comparing inter-institutional programs, for example. Is there a way or a data element that actually identifies uh, groups of rehab clients? Okay, Janice, uh, the so-called functioning related group, yeah. which was uh, mentioned a lot of time in Italy as well as elsewhere, was never uh, brought to life. So right now, the only way that we have to categorize people is through the ICD codes or diagnosis. Then we have a functioning profile. So right now there is no uh, functioning related uh, grouping, uh, it could be uh, that uh, there is a broader way to categorize people in rehabilitation according to intensity and the level of rehabilitation. So we have a, a high level, high complexity, lower complexity, high intensity, lower intensity. That's just a more uh, uh, operational uh, categorization that uh, should then translate in needs so the people with a higher needs and more complex needs would go to a high, high intensity and high complexity rehabilitation and people with lesser would go to those with lesser intensity. But that's all, that's all we have, nothing else. Okay, now we have Laurie and then Gonda Stalinda. Yes. Uh, uh... 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, sorry, sorry, some technical problems. So it was really interesting to hear. And since I have a long history also in education and teaching, it just came to my mind uh, that uh, I would be also very eager to advance uh, something uh, related to, uh, let's say, a new kind of learning tools, for example, e even for like average people, not necessarily people with special needs. I think uh, uh, ICF provides some uh, ways to somehow identify what is the interest and what is the um, strong sides of person, for example, and it might be used also for educational, for general benefits. Uh, uh, have, has there been lots of uh, initiatives in that domain? I would be happy to join and collaborate in respect to machine learning. Okay. Great, Gonda. Hi. Uh, yes, I have uh, also a reaction for Andre. Andre, thank you very much for your nice presentation. And I'm really excited to see how you struggle with the positive uh, elements of the ICF. And uh, I want to advise you, you can use it from now. Why not? You don't have to wait for the positive qualifiers. Please use them. And that's exactly what uh, we are doing now for a lot of years in our um, uh, university medical center. And tomorrow I give a presentation about uh, the digital table. And we always work with patients in the, in the spectrum in, from, from positive to negative. And functioning in essential is about a balance. And for everyone in their life, it's so important when you have a good balance on what kind of things that doesn't matter, then the most of the people are thinking, okay, I am good, I am good functioning, I am good in health or something like that. But that's the most important thing. Functioning is not one ICF category. It's, it's, that's the most big difference with the uh, ICD. ICD is one item, and then we have the health condition. Functioning is not only concentration. Functioning is not only playing an, an instrument or something like that. It's always a couple of things. And that's the most difficult part of thinking about functioning. So um, I was very uh, excited to hear uh, Jeroen uh, Bickenbach this, uh, this morning. And uh, he is talking about functioning as the third health indicator. And I think, yes, we have to work on functioning as the maybe the first health indicator. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then it's necessary that we have an other mindset. It's not the same thing like thinking in a disease. And in 90%, when we are talking about ICF, we are talking about disabilities. And that's also the struggle to input ICF into ICD, that we have to use the framework of diseases. And I agree with Andrea, of course, maybe it's a strategy to get functioning more forward, but it, it's not putting us forward in, in taking the other mindset. So I am very excited about your uh, project. Please go on and show the people that you can use the positive things from now on and, and make that research and publish that research. And then they will see what it will uh, make for a difference when you have the positive items and the negative items. And I agree with uh, Janice, not only for children, it's for the whole population to have the positive uh, items. So that was my comment. Thank you, thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay, we are just in time. I now will invite you to have a little break, uh, 15 minutes, and then we will be back with the next section. Okay? So okay, thank bye. you. Hello. Okay, thank you, Eduardo. <clears throat>
Hey there, everyone, again. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. We had 15 minutes to, to have dinner, to, to have breakfast, to have lunch, wherever you are. Now, let's go to our last block. Um, my point is ICF core sets. I'd like to hear from you some comments after this block. And as you know, I have written something about core sets. And now today I would like to share some little points with you that I think they are really important. And I'd like to know your perspectives on these those thoughts. As everybody knows, ICF uh, corsets can be elaborated from different ways for treatment goals, uh, for big areas like mental health or other and for professions like a corset for PTD, corset for OT, corset for um, work health, social care. And we have ICF, corsets for disease. That's the point of this presentation. I'd like to, to talk about ICF corsets for disease. So what is a corset? What is that? Uh, actually, a core set is the main uh, choose category for um, to cover expected profile from a given disease. So you think about an ICD code ICD-9, ICD-10, whatever. And then uh, ICF categories are previously chosen to cover functioning as a consequence of that disease, okay? Why to do that? Why to do corsets? People who like to use corsets they say uh, several things, but the uh, more frequent sentence I hear is corset, ICF corsets, solve the ICF complexity. So they see ICF complexity as a problem to be solved. And then the corset, the ICF corset, disease corset based on these, I don't know how to say it, but uh, is the solution for the problem. So let's go. I would like to share with you this article. You can take a, a print, print the screen, uh, but it's a very important article to read. Take a read, take a read, sorry. Um, it's not a new one. Actually, it's from 10 years ago or, or more. And it, in that time, made, made me some reflections. And look, there is a sentence in this article that is, However, there is danger, there is a danger of taking one step back in reverting to a disease-specific classification. So, is a ICF corset a disease-specific classification? So, if it does, we are in trouble. Let's see the page four of ICF PDF in English version. version. ICF has moved away from being 
a consequence of disease classification. So ICF has moved away from being a consequence of disease classification. So I have to say again, ICF has moved away from being a consequence of disease classification. If you open the book, the red book, you can uh, read this sentence, this paragraph in the introduction. So let's move away. ICF is not a, classific a classification of disease consequence. That is, it does not refer to the impact of disease on people's health. And how do you feel with this information? Because if, if you don't feel better, maybe your mind is different on the biomedical model. See, there are other documents. This is a document from DRG, some presentation, some old presentation from Olaf. And you can read with me, but look the first phase the first sentence relying ex exclusively on a core set to determine a person's functional level okay functioning level maybe can lead people to miss important individual individual needs this is another work from olaf and next next sorry last year in the annual meeting here he's comparing different different health conditions uh, different icf codes icd codes but children with similar functioning profiles and similar needs so is that possible and is that good to have ICF corset based on specific disease. And this is another article that I would like to share with you. It's from Olaf Camargo também. Sorry, <laughs> it's also from Olaf Camargo. But as we start from the delivery of individualized tailor-made care, we should not attempt to fit all individuals that share the same diagnosis into ready-made solutions that might go too prescriptive. Okay, that is the biopsychosocial model. I'm sorry it is in Portuguese language, but here we do not speak Portuguese or English language, we speak ICF language, and so everybody can understand what is written here. I'd like to show one point. Is there any difference between this model and this model? This is the biopsychosocial model. This is the corset model. Can you see any difference between them? That's the difference this red ball, this red balloon. The real model is multidirectional. So this is not the biopsychosocial model. Let's read ICF again. There is a dynamic interaction among these entities. Interventions in one institute have the post potential to modify one or more of the other entities. These interactions are specific and not always in a predictable one-to-one relationship. So maybe uh, ICF cost based on disease um, take our mind to other models that is not the biopsychosocial model. What else? Let's read ICF again. Point 3.1. In fact, ICF is about all people. The health 
and the health-related status associated with all health conditions, associated is not like as consequence. 3.3, ICF does not classify people, but describe situation of each person. The description is always made within the context of environmental and personal factors, not health condition. condition. And ICF again, page 14, the main, uh, the main information, information matrix is performance and capacity, the two qualifiers in all of the chapters of activities and participation, all of them. We can't uh, choose someone, all of them. See, we can make some adaptions. We, we can see this in ICF, Annex 8, Annex 8. Look, research versions. Here, if you read the paragraph, you can think a course set uh, can do that. Yes, it can. But, uh, but for research versions, and not for clinical use version, okay? We can have course set for clinical use versions in big areas, professions, like I said in the beginning, that is what ICF has in its context. And the last, uh, thing that I would like to uh, say is that complexity. Complexity is what we need. Functioning is complex. So if we want to uh, to describe functioning, we must have a tool as complex as possible to do that. Okay. So good. Um, I would like to hear from you your questions after the block. And now I would like to introduce you to Alexander Evazo. He is a friend of mine. He is not a health professional. And I think he can contribute too much to our discussion. Uh, Alexander, you are uh, co-host, so you can share your screen in the green button. Yes, you are doing that. We are yours. Thank you. Hey, everybody's hearing me. Yes, you can. Uh, Take it lower, please. All right. Uh, well, thank you for having me in this uh, nice panel with uh, so many key and uh, diverse ICF. Special thanks to my dear friend and ICF mentor, Eduardo, uh, for the opportunity. So my uh, issue here is What's beyond the biopsychosocial model? Um, as Eduardo said, I'm not from the medical area, not even close. I am a human geographer uh, and also specialist in politics and strategy. And I am also an experienced user of uh, graphical information technologies. Uh, we are close friends uh, with Eduardo, and I teach in a faculty, a private faculty, the Faculdades Metropolitanas Unidas, uh, in geography as well. And uh, we have an institutional partnership with uh, CIF Brazil, which is Eduardo's institution. Uh, I am from Podu, which is uh, linked to uh, the uh, 
Orthodox Church in, uh, in exile, in exile, no, but in uh, uh, diaspora in Brazil. So that's how we all <laughs> mingled up. Um, anyway, let's start. Well, why do I care about ICF and the biopsychological, the biopsychosocial model? Um, ICF deals with uh, virtually all aspects of a person's life, a person's life, simultaneously and in motion, including those that concern earth, urban, and social sciences. Maybe the same reason. Uh, it appeals to professors, as identified by Andrea in Italy. Among these aspects, among these aspects, uh, CODE, we know that it stands for all the environmental factors in ICF, but the environmental factors listed in ICF Chapter 2 are mostly uh, the same as, almost the same as geographical factors though uh, some codes concern ambience information. Well, uh, environmental factors. Uh, I'm a geographer uh, and we're always worried with uh, environmental issues, but in a broader way, in the same sense as uh, the presentation earlier of Nicolas, Nicolas when uh, she was mentioning the use of maps when she said that, I was really happy about it. I was thrilled because that's the idea. <laughs> um, and as a geographer, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, show my peers what's the importance and the impact of ICF and how we can help it get robust on environmental factors. So if you have a look at this uh, table, I've just uh, painted in gray uh, other uh, codes that actually refer mostly to ambience. All the rest are of geographical interest. And even uh, partly, uh, partly the, the other uh, the gray codes are also of uh, geographical interest. So uh, I think this uh, is something strange to you guys. Uh, you've never seen it. Uh, but before that, we have to uh, look at a model used to approach ICF. So let me just uh, make some uh, notes here. We have uh, in the scheme of, uh, uh, of ICF, we have the body functions and structures, which is not my uh, strength, obviously. And we have activity and participation where we look at individual and social social levels. But then there are the environmental factors in which we have a contextual uh, level to contribute. So I think that uh, geographers, human scientists, uh, and others can uh, contribute in a, in a good extent there. But uh, environmental factors uh, are really our uh, biggest uh, interest. So, as I said, we are always worried with uh, environmental issues, and as a geographer, we have to help in these uh, in forwarding uh, more the environmental factors. Well, we have. <clears throat> Sorry for that. We have the biopsychosocial model. It intends to be anthropocentric. Well, is it? The balance between uh, biological, psychological, and social aspects depends on other aspects. At least this is the proposal here. We live in capitalist societies, so economy drives individual, family, and community, community decision-making. Well, where's the economy in this model? Human societies build many chapters of their history books according to how they dodge and cope 
with environmental challenges. Where's the environment? You only have the natural aspect, biological one. But where's the environment as a whole? Human societies. Human societies were built upon metaphysical perceptions throughout history as explanations for the unknown. That's where science came out, where that's where uh, uh, religions came out. Uh, and these perceptions shape cultures, therefore worldviews and ethics. Well, where's the faith? That invites also anthropology. So see, uh, economy, environment, and faith interact with and affect the performance of all three original aspects of the biopsychosocial model. And that's not so clear. Maybe that is responsible for why uh, human scientists are not human scientists, no, humanities, uh, social, and earth scientists are not so into uh, ICF. So we're proposing to embrace all six aspects. That includes the biopsychosocial model into a larger framework. So how about a eco psycho histological model? What's that? So we have the Greek prefix echo or eco means uh, that means dwelling, inhabited environment, and our social and biological aspects gathered under a simple three-letter Greek prefix. Well, psycho psychology uh, goes beyond uh, the mental, emotional, and affective balance, where it encompasses the mentality of individuals, groups, and societies. So that's where we can go uh, uh, with uh, the psychology of it. The pistiological aspect uh, also contributes to drive mentality in all scales, since it configures moral and ethics of societies through a set of paradigms. So uh, sets of paradigms are managed by organized religions, science, or even in unpredictable frameworks. We have to expect that. We don't know the future, how, how things will develop in, the, in human mentality, human societies. Uh, have in mind that, you know, on top of a hospital bed or a stretcher, many decisions will be made under the influence of individual faith. So I leave it to uh, the last stand is, uh, is the role of faith. You know, in the, in, uh, in the end of life, you have to uh, decide what you want to do with yourself. As in other uh, uh, periods of your life, many times you depend on uh, your uh, paradigms, your personal paradigms that may come from this uh, histological uh, descent. So uh, thank you for having me. I think that I've uh, got to finish here. Thank you very much, Eduardo, and thank you for the panel. Very, very good. I'd like to have a conversation with you and Andres Souza together. You have great ideas. So uh, now we are open to questions. And I'd like to hear from everybody. If you have not, we can move to the next session. Alexander, I, I, I have a question, one question for you. 
if anybody else back. Larry, you are moving yourself. I can hear. <laughs> yeah, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, uh, fantastic um, uh, perspective. What which came from this last uh, as well as the one before that. Uh, the I think uh, the modeling uh, has always the challenge that uh, the simpler the model, it is somehow easier to grasp. But uh, the reality is always more and more complex. And uh, I'm not uh, um, sure uh, what uh, others think, but uh, as a computer scientist, uh, uh, I'm also not like a health professional <clears throat> at all. But uh, from uh, that viewpoint, I have uh, noticed that uh, uh, like someone who like is building uh, houses, uh, he often sees uh, the buildings and uh, how this building could have been built up and so on. And I, as a computer scientist, I have been thinking quite much um, this human process is like an algorithm. And uh, this is one uh, my uh, proposal, kind proposal that if, if you think uh, uh, also like applying algorithmic approach to ICF, uh, more uh, in the future might be one possibility so that uh, uh, I understand that the categorization needs to be strict in a way and clear but on the other hand many things are in constant uh, reformulation also the um, uh, people uh, the new generations think a little bit differently and if we want to catch up what are the profiles and what are the demographical uh, like uh, reference values for each population. It's very demanding to keep up. So uh, besides these uh, nice comments that you have just provided, I, I was just uh, thinking uh, in relation to that, that they also perhaps computer science and this kind of algorithmic th thought could be uh, applied in some context. And uh, of course, I would be really happy to discuss with you about this and uh, how to expand uh, these possibilities with uh, some computer science approach. But, but I, I'm really excited about all these uh, very fresh ideas all the time. Thank you so much. Okay, Alex. Thank you, Larry, for your considerations. Um, actually, I can see, uh, for example, databases interacting with maps uh, without necessarily the uh, health workers, health uh, physicians, uh, uh, you know, uh, working the map, but working the results obtained from the map through algorithm. So that's, that's a, a great possibility. You can uh, consult a database which prepares you to have uh, many of the fixed uh, uh, data that you have for geographical factors as for example, the, the uh, uh, physical geography data that you have there in, in, uh, in the second chapter of, IC, of uh, the environmental factors of the ICF, then it would be uh, fantastic because then, uh, you know, you encourage people to use ICF. That's, that's the issue. That's interesting. Um, and, and I see also things, uh, you know, associating uh, uh, educational workers using ICF as well, since you have a whole public school structure, for example, in Brazil and many other countries do the same, uh, you can have computers uh, linked to algorithms that, uh, uh, that deal with databases and they obtain the data through, you know, a diagnosis that you give uh, through uh, 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 professionals that understand children, understand uh, uh, the patients, etc. So uh, I can foresee something like that in the future, a possibility at least in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex, uh, in, I don't know how to say in English, but there is a film called Come Back to the Future, De Volta para o Futuro. So there is one part that he is in the past 
and he got the guitar and played very well and and but people just stopped to look to him and what's happening and i have never heard somebody playing like that that's how i feel when i i heard i hear from you this new new model or this uh, new name for the model and so i have two questions you are a human geographer that's it but how did you get this idea is it from geography why did you think like that well i guess it's a uh... You know, when you introduce uh, something new to a person, the person usually looks to that uh, with their own eyes. So uh, when I got ICF uh, education from you, <laughs> um, I looked at it with the eyes of a geographer. The demand was different, you know, from my standpoint, from uh, a standpoint of a health worker. So when I looked at ICF, uh, then I started to see uh, the, uh, the environmental factors which uh, called my attention uh, and which uh, actually I, I thought, you know, uh, it's not being used exactly uh, or is it be it's being used but for ambience uh, configuration or consideration, but not in general. For example, uh, physical geography, climate, and other issues. So these things are, uh, you know, they are left behind because you don't have professionals that are working, uh, that are uh, uh, probably qualified to work with these, with these things that are foreseen by ICF. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I got there. Okay, uh, the second question, the last one. Uh, there, are, there are some researchers, some ICF experts that use the term uh, biopsychosocial spiritual model. They don't say biopsychosocial model. They say biopsychosocial spiritual model, like uh, Stefan, Stefan Steeman, he says like that. Is the echo cypo epistemologic model uh, does it have the same meaning of biopsychosocial social spiritual model what do you think okay there there are two things one is that uh, eco is uh, is larger than uh, just the social uh, we're in under globalization, and we are also in inserted in uh, environment. So it's natural for us to to say in geography at least we have a relationship with nature. But what kind of relationship we are dealing with, we are doing. So this type of relationship uh, makes environment something that needs to be. Uh, addressed in, in, in a special way. So you have eco as uh, in economy, which is something that even that other uh, extending uh, uh, name does not touch exactly. And economy drives exactly society in many ways. Uh, we are in capitalism. We're not in another uh, form of uh, working, you know, the world. Um, since we are in globalization, we have we are world citizens, so we have to think uh, in a planet. We don't have to think just uh, uh, as members of a country or a community. Even though we have to take all these scales in account, we can. Uh, we have to take an account that we are also global citizens, global global persons. Um, and last, uh, when I say spiritual, I'm uh, restricting, for example, people that actually don't believe 
in religion. So how about the atheists? How can we include them in, uh, in a framework? Mm -hmm. We are just saying, look, it's spiritual as well. Uh, look, I, I represent also a uh, Orthodox Church uh, 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 institution, as, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that I can't say, I can't consider in my theory and my thought that uh, one day maybe we, uh, the, the health worker has to deal with a person that in that aspect he doesn't believe in God, for example, or in the uh, divinity. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't, you know, I didn't embrace exactly spirit, spiritual. Okay, they are all brothers. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask to Giovanni and Clara be prepared to share the presentations. And now we have a question for, from Pedro, Pedro Martins Jardim. Come on, Pedro. Hello, good afternoon, at least from my point of view. <laughs> uh, I, I found this latest, uh, these last two presentations very uh, insightful and uh, one thing that really impresses me is the complexity of human being and not only the, the individual is complex in itself, but it, it is inserted in, uh, in the whole context that is much, much bigger than we can uh, imagine. Uh, when, and when Alexander uh, brings this this issue about the echo dimension of uh, human experience, it, it, I think it, it tends to broaden our mind and uh, view of uh, the, the human experience. And also Eduardo, when he pushes us further than uh, begin with disease, it's, it's such a small thing when you, with uh, merely with diseases and thinking about these things and the I, I can't help uh, to I can't prevent thinking about complexity and one of the greatest contribution of the studies of complexity is a discipline of cybernetics and it has everything to do with uh, at least in my point of view with um, a, a, a colleague from, I, I forgot her name, uh, Ali? Lo, Laurie. Sorry, Laurie. Yeah, <laughs> but, hello. He's from, uh, from Finland. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And perhaps uh, computer science can help us a lot uh, of making sense of these, all of this complexity. Uh, at least when we begin to register all this data about not only diseases, but everything that relates to human experience. And this is such a, a vast uh, thing. And we, we are forced to work within a interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary team. And I think the computer science, artificial intelligence, it can help us a lot to make sense of all these, uh, these things going on in the experience of uh, human living. And uh, just, just this brief comment I wanted to bring. Great, Pedro, you'd like to say something, Laurie? <laughs> Yes, sorry, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I want to let others talk as well, but I want to very kindly thank for these uh, further comments and still continue a little bit because uh, what what everybody has now already discussed here. Uh, I'm uh, of course very self-critical myself also towards artificial intelligence and about the power struggle so that uh, there's always someone who is deciding beha on behalf of, of us and 
challenges of reliability and so on. But actually, uh, I would be so happy if, for example, in this community we are now sharing, there could be possibility to advance this kind of like completely new kind of open source algorithms that could like help uh, uh, define something which is really open and uh, trustworthy uh, when making decisions about like people's life. And uh, so, for example, uh, as we were hearing, I, if I understood right, that uh, the current uh, uh, challenges for this whole classification system might be partly how much people and organizations adopt uh, them. And uh, I think there is also a big risk that commercial companies very soon can uh, catch this domain and then they are like monopolizing a little bit it. So basically, I was suggesting that it might be great if we could advance uh, this kind of uh, very open uh, way of developing also this algorithm side, which tries to analyze and uh, uh, agglomerate, for example, and link these things together. And uh, I think I, I'm, I'm not the uh, uh, youngest generation, but what I see with my eyes in the current trends, there's lots of like sharing algorithms online. And so it's like uh, for many people, very natural that also these analysis processes could be provided very openly. And I would be really happy if we could like in multidisciplinary way to develop this kind of like solutions. And, and even more, actually we could advance um, uh, not only centralized uh, database systems, but even very, very modern type of distributed solutions. So that if people are, um, for example, uh, trying to, analyze their own data, they should not be necessarily relying on any like um, centralized services. Instead, they could use just the computing power of their own mobile phones so that the data could be kept all the time only in their mobile phones. It will be very like revolutionary also. We could uh, talk about this uh, in future, but I'm very enthusiastic to discuss with you. So I'm ha happy to continue. Great, great. Uh, Gurpreet B. Nepal, uh, you raised your hand and now it's not anymore, but I would like to hear yeah. from you. I, I would like to see you in my screen for the oh, first I'm, time. I'm, I'm having some issues with the video part, so I'll just, I'll be in the audio. Tomorrow I'll show, show up myself. I'll be coming. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the whole thing, you know, the conversation uh, zeroes down to this that firstly, the core sets on um, whatever we use for collecting the data. Like in our part, we, we have to validate all these things. Then, whatever information we get, we can go to the, you know, the higher steps of your analyzing and using the artificial intelligence. And also that, uh, you know, um, there's much of, um, I think, uh, usage what I've heard that in all your part of the uh, this thing, uh, the other part of the globe is that it is being used. But in India, ICF is very much, you know, in, uh, I would say, in primitive stage. I, I might use that word as such because not much of it is heard, not much of it is being used. And my thoughts were, uh, if ever we could have some simple, you know, um, sets, which we could take it down to the grassroots levels, because that is from where the data collection starts. The, the ultimate beneficiaries, maybe the parents or the caregivers or the grassroots health workers, like you have the physicians at the primary health center level, but even below that, we have the uh, workers on foot. So we call them ASHA workers, accredited social health activists who are doing most of this. If ever they can be, you know, uh, their services can be utilized undoubtedly. And I have seen that because I gave, um, I did a research, operational research for tuberculosis control. And I found like they are very useful, but the only thing is they need to be given those tools, simplified, yet not very brief, to get some information and we can make a start from that place. So yes, artificial intelligence all will be helping pro uh, if we have you know, the proper data uh, for analysis. Otherwise it can always backfire. If whatever we are feeding and the machine gives us the feedback, 
but we have not captured what the real needs are, then it might backfire as well. So, and that this will come right from the grassroots levels. The, the people who are there, even like, uh, you know, uh, there have been studies wherein uh, the patients or their relatives reported like this is a favorable outcome, or the rehabilitation outcome based on IC, ICF usage. So the parents of the, these children can be, you know, involved, teach them ICF and you will get a good collection of data. That's my thought on this, you know, take ICF do down to that level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, I uh, would like to share this, those thoughts just because it's how I felt the first time I was looking to ICS and my conclusion was I have to change my mind and ICS course set based on VGs will not make me change my mind. I, I can't, I couldn't understand ICF looking for ICF corsets. So this was my own experience. And that's why I, I brought this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? Okay. So now we have the last presentation from today. Uh, Stennifer is not able to be with us. She had a little health problem. And now we have Giovanni Oliveira Lima. He is a psychologist and I think he can introduce himself and then give us this presentation. Giovanni, we are yours. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, Eduardo, I will talk in Brazilian with you, just to clear some doubts. I don't know how to put a post here to present the post. OK. Você, embaixo, tem um botão verde que está escrito share screen. Quando você clicar nele, você vai com, conseguir compartilhar a sua tela. E aí tudo uh, que aparecer na sua tela, a gente consegue ver. Uh, advanced sharing options. É, deixa eu ver. Qual a opção? Isso. Aí você pode apareceram vários quadrinhos, né? Uh -huh, você você escolhe aqui. um aí onde está a sua. All participants. Only host all participants. Todo, todos os participantes. Ok. Uh, acredito que, que, que deu certo. Deu certo? Ainda não aparece. Hum. Quando você clicar no verde, lá embaixo, share screen. Ah, agora sim. Isso, agora acho que vai. Isso. Ok. Dez minutos você tem. Fica à vontade. Hello, everybody. My name is, is Giovanni. I am psychologist and master student in habitations and science. Um, I live in Brazil. Uh, my work is model disability survey, presentation of the environmental factors, model of the hotel in Brazil. It's my work and Gianni and Nubia. Yeah. The work help organization who has been concerned with expanding the understanding of women functionality and this is as built the model tablet survey MDS best on a psychological psychological biopsychological social sorry vision this work highlights the importance of environmental factors and their influence on women functionality and health 
Thus, the main objective is the 3000 a model happen to the environmental factors of the model disability survey brazil right according to the international classification of functional disability and health icf environmental factors could be on physical and palpable expectancy will react also encompassing social aspects attitudes of the order people and source necessary for human survival. Such environmental factors and coded and factors and or barriers, sorry, really relating to body function functions and structures active and social participation. Facilitators, external resource, physical or social that contribute to the development of human functionality. Barriers on the other hand, have them opposed movement as they are perceived as environment obstacles that hide functionality. The model tablet survey MTS is a tool created by the World Health Organization based on the ICF categories and the other biopsychosocial social health model. It is intended to assess the function profile of adults with without disabilities. This instrument contains items that investigate how much environmental factors interfere with human functionality. Even with people living in the same environment, it's likely that they present different levels of functionality when observed by if See ICF. A facing the biopsychosocial vision for its individual. How methods and materials. This is a descriptive work which solved the present the 3000 A model referring to environmental factors of the model tablet survey and yes. Describing the items is the their response possibilities that MDS is as currently is the process of cross cultural adaptation and validation version. Okay. Eduardo, consegue entender o que eu estou falando? O microfone está legal? O som está legal? Está tudo bem, eu consigo ouvir bem. Okay. Vamos prosseguir. Results. Two categories. And number of items, environments that hide or facilitate the nine items, assistive device and medications assistance, three items, support and relationships, 10 items, attitudes of orders, 11 items, accessibility to information, one item. Model 3000A environment factors of MDS Brazil contains uh, 236 items divided into the following subtopics environment that's high or facilitate, facilitate assisted device and medication assistance, support and relationships, attitudes of orders, accessibility, door information. The forms of, of runs vary between the items being scales from one to five, when one there is, and five by the future. Or one yes, or one yes, and five no, or one it makes very is, and five very difficult, or one very close, and five not at all. Odd one not uh, at all, and five yes to ten. That I else items that are answered with whole numbers. What in the orders that are answered options eight? I don't know, and nine, 98 not application. But when the person is not clued among the other answer options. Okay, all right. Conclusions. 
the MDS Brazil considers environment factors as important in quotation frames for women functional. Evaluate by recent facilities present in the people's lives and how they interfere with functionality. Throughout the items of more three thousand uh, environment factors of this instrument, it will be so possible to measure the defectors, defectors facts to be people and also the source available in the environment, considering both physical and social. The study highlights the importance of considering environment factors and their influence on women's health and infunctional. Understanding the women beings and influenced by the social environment context. Understanding the relationships of reciprocity is possible to broaden the vision of the barriers and facilitators indicated for or indicated by the ICF and to us for fostering the creation for improvement of health policies for people with or without disabilities in order to promote health facilitators reduce the distance between campus and performance and expand their participations. Thank you. Okay, Giovanni, thank you very much for your presentation. Congratulations for your effort. And I can't see any hand here. And I think we are done for today. So I would like to invite Katia Bushala. Are you there? If you are. Yes, you I are. am. Yes, you are our president. Excuse me, Eduardo. Hey there. Hey, Valeria. <laughs> Sorry, Cassia, I have to interrupt you. I have one question. I have one question about the environmental factor. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to talk to you about how we are developing some OT projects at the university I work for. And one of the things that we are dealing with um, is to approach how men who do sex with men uh, have some environmental problems regarding specifically attitudes, uh, so barriers. Uh, I'd like to ask about what, excuse me, what's the name of the person? Giovanni. Giovanni. I'd like to ask him if he knows any research about it or if on the structure that he presented, it can be appreciated by that, that is, I mean, this thing. Did you get my question? Uh, this, I'm, I don't understand you. Okay, so I'm going to. I believe I'm going to ask you in Portuguese, no problem at all. I'm a professor at the Federal do Triângulo Mineiro in Uberaba. Okay. And now we're going to develop a project que vai é, basear-se muito no, no, na CIP, no momento, com os fatores ambientais, mais especificamente com as barreiras atitudinais. E um dos nossos alunos está fazendo uma, uma iniciação científica é, em relação às barreiras atitudinais que são desenvolvidas é, pra, com aqueles homens que fazem sexo com homens. Então, eu queria saber se... Um, Junto ao trabalho que vocês desenvolveram, é, se tem alguma coisa interessante que possa ser aplicada especificamente com respeito a esse item, e se vocês viram referências com respeito a este item, é, para que nós pudéssemos utilizar o que os brasileiros, os terapeutas ocupacionais e fisioterapeutas brasileiros já estejam aplicando aqui no Brasil. Você saiu da, da cena, eu não estou te vendo mais. Eu estou aqui. Estou te ouvindo, agora, Valéria. Agora sim eu estou te vendo. Você está me vendo? Eu estou te vendo, sim. Ok, então vamos lá. Então, Valéria, é, 
Bem interessante essa tua pergunta, né? porque isso faz lembrar também do que eu venho trabalhando no, no mestrado. Né? Atualmente, estou no mestrado de Ciências da Reabilitação, né? na Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Norte, né? aqui no Brasil. E a gente tem trabalhado também com fatores ambientais, porém, é, o que eu tenho pesquisado é em outra linha, mas eu tenho trabalhado principalmente com apoio a relacionamentos e atitudes. Sobre algo específico, né, em relação às relações homoafetivas, né, pelo menos foi o que eu entendi, né, do que tu falou, as relações homoafetivas, homens que se relacionam com outros homens, e a questão de atitude, não é? é bem, a gente não tem exatamente algo sobre isso. É, é, pelo menos eu não cheguei a, a ler algo a respeito. Então, me parece que a tua pesquisa, o teu trabalho é algo bem inovador no campo, é algo que realmente vai vir para contribuir bastante, para expandir é, a ciência né, e os estudos nessa área. É, desde cedo que eu venho acompanhando o evento e eu venho é, assistindo principalmente os trabalhos que são voltados para os fatores ambientais. Eu estou vendo que tem bastante aqui. Então, eu estou vendo que é algo que está em alta de investigação. né? Outro temático também que eu achei bem interessante foi a questão da CIF na, a, e a sua aplicação é, para o autismo. né? Então, eu estou achando bem interessante. Infelizmente, ou felizmente, Valéria, eu não tenho algo para te dizer sobre isso em específico. Né? mas vou até pesquisar mesmo, né? depois de aqui, para expandir mais meus horizontes sobre os fatores ambientais da CIF. Obrigado pela tua pergunta. De nada. Eu posso traduzir? Você acha que há necessidade de traduzir, Eduardo? E, e é, pode, eu, eu me ausentei aqui, mas eu acho que o que você pediu ele não tem, mas você pode só resumir. Ok. So I asked him some references about the theme I asked, and he said that it's something that is very new and he doesn't know anything about it. However, Eduardo, I'd like to know if anyone in the class or in the course uh, knows about it and would like to share uh, with us because it might be including uh, an interinstitutional um, research which might be quite interesting because I don't think I don't see anything Uh, on the occupational therapy with this topic. Mm -hmm. I know that nurses do, mm -hmm. but I don't know anything about OT and I don't know anything sharing the ICF and this kind of, of topic. So mm -hmm. if, there is, if there is anyone here on the course who'd like to share that with me, I'd appreciate, okay? Okay, I, I can share all the contacts if they... Uh give me permission and you can talk everybody i'd like to and besides if there is anyone who is developing a research or would like to do so i think it, it would like a very interesting uh interinstitutional research okay okay now i'd like to invite kasia busala our president to to give us the last words from today We will be back tomorrow. Cassia, we are yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say something to Valeria. Some years ago, we studied a corset for ages. And in this corset, uh, surprisingly, attitudes or stigma was not mentioned by people with ages. You know, they they has no they had no complain against this uh, during our research. So really you don't have anything because AIDS, you know, is very, is where the stigma was present. So. Yeah, but one thing, Cassia, is AIDS. Another thing is the way they are, uh, the people who deal with the places they'd like to share in common with other men, And many yeah. people don't like to see that. We don't know. It's a research, so we yeah. don't know what we are going to find. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And here, the people uh, that have has HIV or AIDS, they are very different because they have a lot of benefits. They have medicine. They are well. You don't know who, who are these people. 
they are living normally. Uh, thanks God. So, Cássia, just to share something to you. Uh, I know that you are in São Paulo. Yeah. Yeah. I am, I, am yeah. Minas, I am in Minas Gerais. I know. I and know. it's different here. <laughs> Yeah, my my. So can you, can you imagine here. that in the north of Brazil, in the northeast of Brazil, in the south of we don't oh, yeah. know. So yeah, I I'm, I was referring to the uh, research was done here in Sao Paulo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Let's see well, what what we are going to find out. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting project. Okay, I'll let you know next year. Oh, well, I hope so. Okay, I uh, I think we had a wonderful day. It is almost five o'clock in São Paulo, and do, all this time, all do, since eight o'clock in the morning, we were listening to very interesting experience on the ICS. Uh, I hope this all this um, all this knowledge. Uh, stay with us and that you can think about it and be prepared for another wonderful day tomorrow. So thank you, Eduardo, for doing this, for organizing, for coordinating. And uh, I see you all tomorrow morning. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to Gonda, Stefan, Olaf, Catherine, and everybody who is helping hey. us this day. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye.